I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I am about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. Edgar Allan Poe, William Wilson Prologue 544 Castle Drive I first saw 544 Castle Drive on a cold Christmas morning in 1991. My wife, son, and I had flown from Boston to Raleigh-Durham to join my mother-in-law and Aunt Elizabeth, her older sister, in St. Paul's, North Carolina, a small town about twenty miles south of Fayetteville. There were hardly any grandchildren. Our son Hamilton, who was four years old, was the adored new addition to the family. I can't remember whether it was the year of the train set or the year of the tricycle, but it was a perfect day. Often on Christmas we would pick pecans at a nearby farm. You open them by holding two pecans in your hand so you can crack one against the other. It was a wonderful small town world. The red brick house with the glassed-in porch and rockers, the breakfast room that looked out on the garden, the green spowed china, the ribbons in the living room from unwrapped presents. We were a young and loving family. My wife and I decided on a small excursion before Christmas dinner. She had wanted to get out of the house. The destination was more or less my idea. A short drive north on the old U.S. highway past Hope Mills, where my mother-in-law and aunt had been born, to Fayetteville, past a pygmy replica of the Eiffel Tower at the Bordeaux Shopping Center, and then on to Fort Bragg. In those days, Fort Bragg was an open base, easily accessible. It wasn't hard to get around, and after consulting various road maps, we found it. There we were, standing in the cold, looking at the attached home where Jeffrey MacDonald, a physician and Green Beret, had lived with his family until February 17, 1970. Early that morning, MacDonald's wife, Colette, and his two daughters, Kimberly, aged five, and Kristen, aged two, were brutally murdered there. The MacDonald case has produced vast quantities of material. Some of this can be found on websites exclusively devoted to the case, some is in various law offices around the country. Those of a dozen or so defense and appellate attorneys who have represented MacDonald over the years. Somewhere in this material, I found a photograph of Jeffrey MacDonald, Colette, and Kimberly. I'm not sure when it was taken. It might have been before Kristen was born. It was Christmas. On the left, a tree covered in tinsel and surrounded by presents. On the right, a fireplace and mantle covered with decorations. Jeffrey is peeking into the picture, just at the edge of frame, as if he's trying to decide which present to open next. Kimberly, in a party dress with a white collar, is being handed a big blonde doll by her mother. She looks thrilled. It's a universal picture. I had seen photographs of the house. The house the day after the story of the murders broke. The house in subsequent years, the windows covered by plywood. The house had been kept sealed from 1970 until 1984 in the event that it and its contents might be needed as evidence. But on the night of June 7, 1984, the contents were burned and then buried at the Fort Bragg landfill. The government made a list of the property that had been destroyed. Refrigerator Stove, broiler pan, occasional dining room table with four chairs, government knee hole desk, dresser, army chair, push lawnmower, yard rake, sprinkler. Everything that wasn't already locked up in a lab was incinerated, including the ceilings, interior walls, Doors, window sills, ledges, hardwood floors. Was some piece of evidence that could have unraveled the entire mystery lost in that bonfire? Could the house itself be interrogated? Could it have been forced to give up an answer? 
I have asked myself many times since that Christmas day, why didn't I plunge into the case then? It was shortly after I had finished The Thin Blue Line, the film based on my investigation of the Randall Dale Adams case, an investigation that had freed an innocent man from prison and had gotten a confession from the killer. I had struggled with that story for four years, only to be sued by the man I got out of prison. I told myself I didn't want to become involved in another miscarriage of justice story. They're difficult, perhaps too difficult. I didn't want to go through the agony, the risk, a second time. And yet this was a different kind of miscarriage of justice, different from what we normally envision as a miscarriage of justice. The McDonald story does have familiar themes, suppressed evidence, prosecutorial misconduct, bumbling investigators, forensic mix-ups, and so on. But there are new and different themes as well, many involving the media. Books, late-night talk shows, and a TV miniseries. There is something disturbing about the McDonald case, something that has made me return to it again and again over the years. It wasn't the brutality of the murders. I've interviewed my share of mass murderers, including Ed Gein and Edmund Kemper. I was afraid of something even more chilling, that MacDonald was innocent, that he had been made to witness the savage deaths of his family and then was wrongfully convicted for their murders. I wondered if people needed him to be guilty because the alternative was too horrible to contemplate. It has been so long since I first became interested. I recently looked at my notes on what I had imagined doing with it, beginning in 1991. I am a filmmaker, so I first imagined it as a movie. I went to a variety of studio meetings, but the movie I wanted to make was non-standard. The Pitch there are two opposed theories of what happened at 544 Castle Drive on the morning of February 17, 1970. Neither had been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet most Americans had only ever been presented with half a story. The half that held that McDonald was definitely the killer. The half that was the basis for Joe McGinnis's Fatal Vision, a best-selling book that was adapted into a TV miniseries. So let me describe the movie that I imagined. I wanted to cast Gary Cole, who played McDonald in the TV miniseries, and to use him for my own reenactments of the case. I would juxtapose these reenactments with scenes from the original TV movie. It would be a version of Rashomon, the film by Akira Kurosawa, with competing narrators and different points of view. Here, it would be by the same actor. Such a movie, I thought, could open the case back up and show how critical evidence was ignored or suppressed, how the evidence that was introduced does not confirm McDonald's guilt. It could help people think and decide for themselves. I stopped. The studio executive across the table clearly wanted to say no. She paused for a moment and said, We can't make that. I asked why. Because he's guilty, she said. The man killed his family. And I said, But he might be innocent. And she said, No, he killed his family. It became a recurring theme. People thought they knew the story, but it was because they had read the book, or had seen the TV miniseries, or both. And the important question was lost under the heap. Had anyone proved that Jeffrey MacDonald was guilty of the murder of his family? Millions of words have been spoken, written, read. Affidavits, court transcripts, lab reports, videotaped interviews, newspaper articles, and now even blogs. But what do they really tell us? Book One Chapter One A Convincing Story If God were suddenly condemned to live the life he has inflicted on men, he would kill himself. Alexander Dumas, Pensy d'Album It's a 19th century image, an island fortress, forbidding, dark, isolated, surrounded on all sides by cliffs and the sea. 
In Alexander Dumas' 1844 novel, The Count of Monte Cristo, that fortress is the Chateau d'If. Daltes, who will become the Count of Monte Cristo, has been taken prisoner. In a rowboat, he is pleading with his captors. He demands to know where he is being taken. Unless you are blind or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you, then. Dantes rose and looked forward, when he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock on which stands the Chateau d'If. This gloomy fortress, which has for more than three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dantes like a scaffold to a man condemned to death. The Chateau d'If, he cried. What are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. Surely I am not going there to be imprisoned, said Dantes. It is a prison for high crimes of state and is used only for political prisoners. I have committed no crime. Dantes, a fictional character, has been framed for a crime he did not commit. He has been convicted and condemned by Dumas, his creator, to a prison from which there is no possibility of escape. And yet Dantes does escape, under an improbable set of circumstances that have been told and retold, and that have inspired countless other stories. Dumas's tale is a variant of the theme, Never Say Never. There is no fortress, no prison, from which there is no escape. We marvel at Dantes's daring, the fake burial at sea, the swim to a nearby island, the construction of a new, fabulous identity. But we know that he has escaped only because Dumas wants it so. There can be no denying his innocence, just as there can be no thwarting his inexorable climb to a position of wealth, power, and influence. Dumas has written it that way. In a fictional narrative, all of the pieces can be engineered to fit perfectly together. But reality is different. We have to discover what it is out there what is real and what is merely a product of our imagination. A real Dantes could turn out to be a schemer, a rat, a traitor. There is in principle no limit to what we might find out about him, to what we might uncover. A real Dantes, like all real characters, is bottomless. Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, captured this in his Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy written while he was in prison as a conscientious objector to World War I. Prisoners often have the time to reflect on the difference between artificially constructed stories and reality. When you have taken account of all the feelings roused by Napoleon in writers and readers of history, you have not touched the actual man. But in the case of Hamlet, you have come to the end of him. If no one thought about Hamlet, there would be nothing left of him. If no one had thought about Napoleon, he would have soon seen to it that someone did. It's now the 21st century, and we have a model of a prison that makes the Chateau d'If pale in comparison. Not an imagined prison of stone and steel, but a real prison built out of newsprint and media, a prison of beliefs. You can escape from prison, but how do you escape from from a convincing story. After enough repetitions, the facts come to serve the story and not the other way around. Like kudzu, suddenly the story is everywhere and impenetrable. Take the case of Jeffrey MacDonald. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the story was endlessly retold in the media. It was enshrined in a best-selling book, Fatal Vision by Joe McGinnis, in TV journalism, 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace, and ultimately in an incredibly popular TV miniseries with the same title as the book, starring Carl Malden, Gary Cole, and Eva Marie Saint. The 60 Minutes segment on September 18, 1983, was the season premiere of the show. It was watched by 30 million people. The book appeared a couple of months later, and in the following years sold 5 million copies. The two-part miniseries on NBC was the most popular miniseries of the year. Eventually, the media frenzy ran its course, and the public was sated with the version of events it had been fed. 
The case was cracked. Punishment was administered. Justice had been done. And Jeffrey MacDonald was condemned to the story that had been created around him. The MacDonald case was once well known, but is quickly lapsing into obscurity. MacDonald was on the fast track, Princeton for three years, medical school at Northwestern, a Green Beret captain at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. He had been accepted for a residency in orthopedics at Yale to follow his service in the military. He was young, handsome, and married to his childhood sweetheart, Colette Stevenson. They had two young daughters, Kimberly, aged five, and Kristen, aged two. They dreamed of owning a farm in Connecticut. They had a bright and promising future. That ended early on the morning of February 17, 1970. The MPs who had responded to a call for help had found Colette, who was four months pregnant with a son, lying on the floor of the master bedroom. She had been brutally beaten and stabbed. Both her arms had been broken, her skull had been fractured, and there were numerous knife stabs in her chest and neck, as well as twenty-four of what appeared to be ice-pick stabs to her chest and arm. Kimberly and Kristen had been found dead in their beds. Kimberly had been stabbed, and the right side of her head had been crushed in with a club. Kristen had been stabbed, but there were no fractures. There was blood everywhere. MacDonald told Ken Micah, one of the first MPs at the scene, Check my kids. I can't breathe. Micah began to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. MacDonald was lapsing in and out of consciousness, but he described to Micah how he had been sleeping on the couch in the living room, then was awakened by screams. He saw people at the foot of the couch. Micah asked whom he had seen, and MacDonald described the assailants. There were four of them. One blonde Caucasian female. She had a floppy hat on. Two male Caucasians and one male Negro. Why did they do this? Micah told Lieutenant Joseph Polk, one of his superiors, that he had seen a woman matching the description on his way to the McDonald home, but no effort was made to pick her up. Within minutes, McDonald was loaded into an ambulance and taken to Womack Army Hospital, where he was treated for multiple bruises and abrasion, small punctures, two stab wounds, one in his stomach and one in his chest, and a collapsed lung, a serious injury but not a mortal one. Specialist 4th Class William Ivory was the investigator on duty for the Fort Bragg office of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Division of the Army. He arrived about 15 minutes after the first MPs and took detailed notes on what he saw. A woman, apparently dead, is lying on her back next to a green armchair. The upper portion of her body was extremely bloody. She was clad in what looks like pink pajama pants. Across her abdomen, a towel or bath mat is laying. Across her chest was some blue cloth, with a part of it trailing across the floor to her left side. This was later identified as the blue pajama top. Ivory observed that Colette MacDonald had multiple head injuries and stab wounds in her chest and throat, and a large pool of blood was found under her head and shoulders. Nearby, there was a pajama pocket apparently torn from the pajama top, and then he found what appeared to be a murder weapon. Between the green armchair and the dresser on the north wall, there is observed a small wooden-handled knife. A close inspection revealed a bloodstain near the point of the blade. Ivory went on to note that the living room was relatively tidy. The furnishings on the west side of the living room did not appear to have been disturbed. A coffee table in the east side of the living room in front of a brown divan was tipped on its edge, and under the edge there were numerous magazines, the titles of which were not noted at the time. There is a plant with the roots in dirt a few feet east of the overturned table, and a white plant pot sitting upright just north of the edge of the table. About a half hour later, Robert Shaw, another CID investigator, arrived. His case file continues the story of the investigation. Three weapons were discovered just outside the back door of the house. At 0642 hours, a search of the outside of the quarters was conducted by this investigator. 
found, located near the northeast entrance to the quarters, a wooden club which appeared to bear bloodstains and a paring knife with a brown handle and an ice pick with a tan wood handle. The location of these items was sketched and the weapons were collected as evidence. The decision was made to collect this evidence because the photographer on the scene had run out of film or bulbs or had some other tech problem and there would be an appreciable delay before he could take a picture. Ivory, a young and relatively inexperienced agent, quickly came to the conclusion that there was something wrong with the crime scene. There were signs of a struggle, but perhaps not enough to suggest the presence of four intruders. It wasn't long before Ivory and Shaw devised their own theory of the crime. Narratives are ubiquitous. They are part of the way people see the world, part of the way people think, all of us, myself included. Without them, we would be overwhelmed with undigested raw facts. But that doesn't mean that all narratives are created equal. There is fiction, and there is non-fiction. And one of the differences between fiction and fact is that a fictional character is controlled by its creator. It has no reality off the page. There is no physical evidence that can prove that Edmond Dantes is guilty or innocent of a crime. Only what the writer, the author, ultimately decides. But what happens when the narrative of a real-life crime overwhelms the evidence? When evidence is rejected, suppressed, misinterpreted, or is left uncollected at the crime scene, simply because it does not support the chosen narrative. It is easy to confuse a search for revealing plot details with a search for evidence, but there is a difference. In one case, we are wandering through a landscape of words. In the other, we are in the physical world. By all accounts, the crime scene was horrific. Three bloody and battered bodies. But one detail stood out. On the headboard in the master bedroom, the word pig was written in blood, recalling, perhaps reenacting, the Manson family murders committed only months before. In a real sense, the story of the McDonald murders begins in the summer of 1969 with Charles Manson and his drug-crazed followers. Chapter 2 Lee Marvin is Afraid On August 9, 1969, Sharon Tate, the wife of Roman Polanski and eight and a half months pregnant, Jay Sebring, Wojciech Frykowski, Stephen Parent and Abigail Folger were shot and stabbed to death in Polanski's Los Angeles home. Polanski was in Europe, otherwise he might have been a suspect in the case. The murders of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca followed the next day. At 10050 Cielo Drive, the Polanski home, the word pig was written on the wall, as it later turned out, in Sharon Tate's blood. At the LaBianca home, two phrases, death to pigs and helter-skelter. At first, police believed the Tate and LaBianca murders were unrelated. They also were convinced that the murders were connected with a drug transaction gone awry. When evidence began to accumulate, the idea of hippie killers was explicitly rejected. One police sergeant simply said, We know what's behind these murders. They're part of a big dope transaction. Similarly, army investigators rejected the idea that hippie killers had broken into the house at 544 Castle Drive, had killed McDonald's family, and had written pig on the headboard of the bed. On February 17th, the day of the murders, the headline in the Fayetteville Observer took the form of a question. Victims of hippie cult? Officer's wife, children found slain at Fort Bragg. Apparently, there was already skepticism about McDonald's account of what had happened the previous night. The victims were identified as McDonald's wife, Colette, 26, and the couple's two daughters, Kimberly, 5, and Kristen Jean, 2. Military authorities said McDonald told them four people, three men and a woman, burst through the rear door of the home at approximately 4 a.m. chanting, LSD is great, LSD is great, while the family slept. 
One of the suspects, a blonde woman wearing a floppy hat and muddy white boots, was carrying a candle, according to a report from the investigating officers. Officers said another suspect was a Negro man wearing a jacket with sergeant stripes on the sleeves. The two other suspects were reportedly white men, they said. Just three days later, another question was raised about McDonald's account of what happened. A February 20th article in the New York Times reported that McDonald had made a comment to a friend, Lieutenant Ronald Harrison, who was reading an Esquire magazine article about the Manson murders. Isn't that wild? The cover of the March 1970 issue of Esquire was Evil Lurks in California. Lee Marvin is Afraid. Amid the ads for Pierre Cardin slacks and canoe aftershave, there was page after page of various kinds of malefaction. An acid goddess who copulates with a swan, a chair that spouts blood, black masses, drugs, and more drugs, and, of course, Manson and his family. From Harrison's various comments to Army investigators that were released to the press, it might be imagined that MacDonald was interested in some form of Satanism or ritual abuse. Isn't that wild? But a signed statement from Harrison dated July 13, 1970, paints a more ambiguous picture. Although various prosecutors eventually portrayed McDonald's comment in a sinister light, Harrison was describing a happy home environment, the Brady Bunch with a little witchcraft thrown in. Since I was quoted in the newspapers as saying Jeff and I discussed the Sharon Tate murder case, I feel that I should explain the conversation in its entirety. On Saturday, the 14th of February, I stopped by Jeff's about 7.30 or 8 in the evening. Working clockwise, Colette was seated on the couch, Jeff in his chair, I in mine, Kim on the floor with her PJs on, watching TV from a bear-shaped sleeping bag. We were watching TV and discussing the programs, and I was playing with Kim on the floor. I noticed an Esquire magazine, among others, on the coffee table. On the cover it said, Evil Lurks in California, Lee Marvin is Afraid. I called attention to the magazine and picked it up, and Jeff said, Go ahead and read that. It's wild. So I opened the magazine, and the first article I saw was one with illustrations of necklaces in the form of devil signs and people participating in a witchcraft ceremony. The next page had an article about a girl called Lita and her black swan, which we discussed. I turned the page and saw an article on the Sharon Tate murders. We said it was terrible and that drug abusers were sick, disturbed people. I closed the magazine and placed it back on the table, and we continued watching TV. Altogether, the conversation about the entire series of articles lasted about ten minutes out of a two-and-a-half or three-hour visit, and most of that ten minutes we discussed Lita and her black swan. What was the New York Times headline really saying? Friend says Captain discussed Tate killing. Was there a suggestion that the articles in Esquire might have been the trigger for McDonald's homicidal rage? Was the reader being asked to wonder whether McDonald had decided to create a Manson-like crime scene in order to deflect attention from himself? Harrison's statement, taken five months after the murders, was never publicized in the newspapers. I spoke with another friend of McDonald's, Carol Buckner. Her husband was a surgeon with the Special Forces at Fort Bragg. Carol Buckner. They were the first people we met in Fort Bragg. Kimmy was the older one, and Christy was the younger one. And Kimmy was very articulate. You could tell her mind was really quick. They loved their daddy. Man, he would come in and they'd go hang on him and grab his boots. They just adored him. Now, I don't mean to say that I was over there all the time, but I would see the girls with him. And I remember I overheard a conversation Colette had at Thanksgiving on the phone. I was in the kitchen doing dishes with her or something, and she said, Well, maybe you could tell by hearing my side of the conversation that I'm pregnant. And I hadn't known that until then. And I said, Congratulations. And she had had some problems with pregnancies, and she said, I just gotta watch some things. And then sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas, I remember I was over there after lunch, and Jeff was going back to the office. And I remember he said to Kimmy and Christy, Now you make Mommy put her feet up on the coffee table and don't let her get up and do things because she needs to rest and she needs to keep her feet up. And so he said, Now I'm counting on you to do that. 
And they said, yes, Daddy. Errol Morris. What a horribly sad story. Oh, I know. It was such a horrible, horrible thing. And it happened not so long after the Sharon Tate murders. And people who hear about the case now want to think that there's CSI and all this incredibly sophisticated evidentiary testing. And it just wasn't the case then. And the times were so turbulent. America was completely divided. It's hard for people to remember the 70s. These guys, my husband and Jeff and others, being in special forces, they were real gung-ho America and military. And then there were all the anti-military people, and it was a very contradictory and violent time. Only ten weeks had elapsed between the first Manson arrests and the death of McDonald's family. News reports of the Manson murders were everywhere, in national and local newspapers, on the evening news, and in countless magazine articles. It was the crime of the century. It was something people read about and talked about. Wouldn't it have been more remarkable if MacDonald had not read or talked about it? Given the notoriety of the Manson family, couldn't a local group of drug-crazed hippies have been just as easily or more easily inspired by any of the countless news stories about the Manson murders? Was MacDonald imitating Manson in order to implicate some imagined group of hippies, or were there real hippie intruders in the house, also possibly imitating Manson? Can any piece of evidence flip back and forth? One moment it provides proof of one thing, the next moment proof of its exact opposite? Chapter 3 Breaking the Sound Barrier I was twelve years old, watching and re-watching on television David Lean's Breaking the Sound Barrier. The film was part of a program called Million Dollar Movie that played on Channel 9, WWOR-TV, in the New York metropolitan area. Each program started with various shots of New York City at night, set to Max Steiner's theme music for Gone with the Wind, and was repeated through the week. I saw Breaking the Sound Barrier many, many times, maybe six or seven, it tells the story of how British pilots were the first to fly faster than the speed of sound, an apocryphal claim that did not particularly delight Chuck Yeager, the American pilot who actually did break the sound barrier. It's a terrific film, despite its historical inaccuracies. The detail that still haunts me involves the movie's central plot point, that the controls of an airplane are reversed as it passes through Mach 1, the speed of sound. Normally, a pilot pulls back on the stick to pull out of a dive. In David Lean's film, we are told that at Mach 1, he has to do the exact opposite. We see shot after shot of a pilot approaching the sound barrier, the needle on the Mach meter twitching back and forth, horrible buffeting and shaking. The forces seem to be too great. The plane will be ripped apart, and then the pilot pulls back on the stick his assumption is that the plane will pull out of its dive and soar into the air. But it doesn't. It goes into a steeper dive and plunges into a field, leaving a huge, smoking crater. In the movie, Philip Peel, a test pilot, and Will Sparks, an aeronautical engineer, debate what this means. Could the controls of an airplane be reversed at Mach 1? Philip Peel is it possible that at the speed of sound the controls are reversed? Will Sparks. At the speed of sound, Philip, anything is possible. Why? During the war once, I put a spitfire into a flat-out dive. No very good reason, just youthful high spirits. I think now that I hit the sound barrier. I remember that the more I pulled on the stick, the harder the nose went down. The same thing happened this morning. You're not supposed to do a high mark number. I know, but I did. Both times I had the feeling that if I'd had the guts to put the stick forward instead of pulling it back, I could have pulled out without having to lose speed. What do you think? There's nothing in the books to suggest for one second anything so Edgar Allan Poe-ish. Well, it depends on the books now, doesn't it, Will? There were books once that said the world was flat. In reality, the controls are not reversed at Mach 1, but I have often thought that this idea, this breaking the sound barrier idea, this Edgar Allan Poe-ish idea, captures a deep fear. 
What if our expectations trick us into a false sense of security? What if everything is the opposite of what it seems? That plus becomes minus, left becomes right, up becomes down, pull forward becomes push back. Like the turkey that fails to realize that today is different from all previous days. It's Thanksgiving. The farmer is coming, but he isn't bringing food. This time, he's bringing an axe. Twenty-five years later, I traveled to Dallas on my birthday to interview a psychiatrist, James Grigson, who had earned the nickname Dr. Death because of the unusual role he played in death penalty cases in Texas. The Dallas District Attorneys encouraged psychiatrists to testify in capital murder trials, but not just any psychiatrists. They had two psychiatrists in mind, psychiatrists who had been prosecution stooges in the past, Dr. James Grigson and Dr. John Holbrook. The DA's technique used to secure death sentences was crude but effective. Have the psychiatrists make predictions of future dangerousness based on a diagnosis of psychopathy. It was mumbo-jumbo, but it worked. The psychiatrists and the diagnosis gave prosecutors the imprimatur of medical respectability and gave the jury the confidence to impose a death sentence. Dr. Grigson was an affable presence. I rather liked him. In our first meeting, I had asked him about his private practice, and he ruefully admitted that it had suffered because of his newly minted notoriety. As he explained it, Patients are a little reluctant to bear their souls to someone named Dr. Death. But about sociopaths and psychopaths, Grigson was unequivocal. His mantra was, They're different from you and me. At his instigation, I started interviewing Texas inmates who had been sentenced to death. And so my initial meeting with Dr. Grigson eventually led to Randall Dale Adams, an inmate who had been convicted of killing a Dallas police officer labeled a sociopath, and sentenced to death. It also led me into a two-year investigation of a terrible miscarriage of justice. An innocent man, Adams, was almost executed. And to my movie, The Thin Blue Line, which helped overturn his conviction and led to his release from prison in 1989. The case against Randall Dale Adams involved the cold-blooded murder of a Dallas police officer, Robert Wood. He was shot and killed during a routine traffic stop early in the morning of November 28, 1976. When a police officer is gunned down in cold blood, there is enormous pressure to solve the case and punish the perpetrator. This crime remained unsolved for nearly a month. No clues, nothing. And then information was presented to the police that David Harris, a 16-year-old kid from Vidar, Texas, a small town 300 miles away, had boasted to his friends that he had offed a pig in Dallas. In custody, he blamed a hitchhiker, Randall Dale Adams, with whom he had spent the day prior to the killing. Adams was arrested and within a short amount of time was charged with the murder. Harris told the police that he had been a passenger in the car and had witnessed the murder, but the crime had been committed by the driver. The alleged driver, Adams, had a bad excuse, although it happened to be the truth. He was home in bed at the time of the murder. At Adams' 1977 trial, Grigson testified, as expected, that Adams was a sociopath who had killed and would kill and kill again. He was wrong on both counts. He had also made an assessment that Harris had never killed and would never kill in the future. He was again wrong on both counts. I am fond of pointing out that on that occasion Dr. Grigson was 400% wrong. It's difficult to do it, but he did it. And he did it with the aid of the diagnosis of psychopathy. Dr. Grigson provided answers to the questions. Why didn't Randall Dale Adams change his physical appearance after the murder of the Dallas police officer? Why didn't he leave town? Why did he go to work every day? Normally, these pieces of evidence would be mildly exculpatory, but certainly they wouldn't count toward his guilt and against his innocence. Why didn't he run? Dr. Grigson had a simple explanation. 
because he is different from you or me, because he doesn't have feelings like you or me. I also have a simple explanation, because he hadn't done anything. He saw no reason to run. He was innocent. But the minute Grigson described him as a psychopath, evidence that would count for Adam's innocence suddenly counted for his guilt. Nothing has changed except a diagnostic label, and suddenly evidence that would normally be considered mildly exculpatory becomes strongly inculpatory. To me, psychopathy is like the controls of the jet in breaking the sound barrier. Everything is reversed. Why didn't Adams change his appearance? Because he's a stone-cold killer. Why didn't he run? Because he doesn't have feelings like you and me. A normal person would have run, but a psychopath was able to make decisions based on reason, not emotion. Doug Mulder, Adams's prosecutor, summed it up in his elaborate notes taken in preparation for the trial. Mulder argued that Adams made a calculation. To run would be the worst thing that he could do. Adams found himself heading inexorably toward Old Sparky, the Texas electric chair. I remember the first time I met him. This was long before I came to believe in his innocence. His voice at times had a sing-song quality, as if he himself didn't believe what he was saying. At other times, he was clearly angry. Contemplating the colossal run of misconceptions and lying that led to his conviction, who wouldn't be angry? Later, I came to believe that so many people had questioned his veracity and his motives that he almost gave up pleading for his innocence. He assumed, correctly, that everybody thought he was lying, and there was little point in claiming his innocence anymore. Is there a point where, if everyone thinks you're lying, you come to believe that you're lying, even when you're telling the truth? People have an idea about how innocent prisoners should conduct themselves, but they probably have never had the experience of being sentenced to death or life imprisonment for a crime they did not commit. Chapter 4. A Subtly Constructed Reflex Machine I will wear my heart upon my sleeve, for Dawes to peck at. I am not what I am. William Shakespeare, Othello very few people have heard of him, but Hervey Cleckley, a Georgia psychiatrist and Rhodes scholar, wrote two of the most influential books of the 20th century, The Three Faces of Eve and The Mask of Sanity. These books single-handedly created the myth of the multiple personality disorder and the myth of the psychopath, myths arguably as powerful as those created by Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, and Robert Louis Stevenson, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Psychopathy had been on my mind for years. It became an important theme in the thin blue line, since the diagnosis had been instrumental in sending Randall Adams to death row. I wanted to talk to Cleckley, and I eventually called his home in Athens, Georgia, hoping for an interview. It was in early February 1984. He had died the week before. The Mask of Sanity first appeared in 1941 and went through many subsequent editions. The fourth edition appeared in 1964. Joseph J. Michaels, in his review, captured the strange quality of the work, something between fantasy and reality. The book is well written, with many references to the literature. The style suggests that of a novelist, although portraying real characters in a dramatic fictional manner. Cleckley indeed provides his own bizarre case studies of psychopathic behavior. They consist of a series of absurd cautionary tales. He comes off as an eccentric, sex-obsessed uncle, like a family member who insists on bringing up unsavory and somewhat lascivious details at the dinner table. I might characterize this genre as the pornuncular. He goes from one lurid case history to another. One of my favorites involves a young man accused of the wanton murder of 44 people. Cleckley quotes a Newsweek report on the trial. At times he watched the proceedings with wide, staring eyes that showed no emotion. At other times he read a book, 
The Mask of Sanity by Dr. Hervey Cleckley. When the verdict was announced, he bit his lower lip, but otherwise remained impassive. His wife, Gloria, 22, the mother of his two small children, broke down and sobbed hysterically. I couldn't help myself. I had to find out something more about the actual case. It concerned John Gilbert Graham, whose mother was going to visit his sister in Alaska. He placed a bomb in her luggage, and then bought six life insurance policies from a vending machine at the airport. Total cost? One dollar and fifty cents. Total payout? Thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Forty-four people died when the plane exploded over a sugar beet field in Colorado. And no, Graham didn't collect. Not just because he had been caught. He had neglected to have his mother sign the policies. Eventually, Clackley returns to his theme. The difference between disease and the feigning of disease. And the flip side, the difference between normalcy and the feigning of normalcy. It is this distinction that becomes central to Cleckley's idea of the psychopath. He writes, We are dealing here not with a complete man at all, but with something that suggests a subtly constructed reflex machine which can mimic the human personality perfectly. This smoothly operating psychic apparatus reproduces consistently not only specimens of good human reasoning, but also appropriate simulations of normal human emotion in response to nearly all the varied stimuli of life. So perfect is this reproduction of a whole and normal man that no one who examines him in a clinical setting can point out in scientific or objective terms why or how he is not real. And yet we eventually come to know or feel we know that reality, in the sense of full, healthy experiencing of life, is not here. Here it is, the psychopath as modern monster, the terminator, the robot without feeling, the mechanical man devoid of a soul. And for Cleckley, this simulacrum, this golem, is indistinguishable from a real person even though no one can point out in scientific or objective terms why he is not real. Something is missing. What could any defendant do to defeat the diagnosis of psychopathy, if the diagnosis is based not on disease, but on the feigning of normalcy? The answer? Nothing. There is a fundamental problem. Since phenomenologically a psychopath is no different from a normal person, how can we prove that a seemingly normal person is a psychopath? The problem gets much worse when the diagnosis is used to establish guilt. How do we know he did it? Because he's a psychopath, and psychopaths do that sort of thing. He's guilty because he's a psychopath, and he's a psychopath because he's guilty. Cleckley's idea, unlike reversing the controls and breaking the sound barrier, can't be tested. At the sound barrier, a pilot can find out whether the controls are reversed. When you pull forward on the stick, does the jet pull out of its dive, or does it pitch headfirst into the ground? Regardless of whether the story is false in the real world, in the narrative it can be tested. It is an empirical principle. Cleckley's idea, on the other hand, cannot be tested. The psychopath's inner deviation from the normal impresses me as one subtly masked and abstruse. So, too, it has often seemed that interpersonal and environmental factors, if they contribute to the development of his disorder, are likely to be ones so disguised superficially as to appear of an opposite nature. In the years since the publication of The Mask of Sanity, the concept of psychopathy has been changed along with its name. Psychopathy is now diagnosed alongside sociopathy, or antisocial personality disorder, with few experts able to agree on whether they are naming the same thing, or two or three things that are slightly different. But the biggest change involves the idea that psychopathy involves predation, along with camouflage. The Handbook of Psychopathy, a recent compendium of articles on the subject, compares the psychopath to a spider. Like Amyceae lineatopes, a species of arachnid that mimics the physical appearance of ants on which it preys, psychopathic individuals readily gain the trust of others because they come across on initial contact as likable, adjusted, and well-meaning. 
It is only through continued interaction and observation that the psychopath's true, darker nature is revealed. The key word is interaction. It is not what a psychopath thinks so much as what a psychopath does. The mask of sanity, the false appearance of sanity, makes us think that we are being set up, lured, tricked by someone getting us to do his or her bidding. The smile masks a frown. The handshake conceals a weapon. It is the psychopath as trickster, as confidence man. This concept of psychopathy would eventually seal Jeffrey McDonald's fate. It explains the inexplicable, how someone who was so accomplished, so respected, could commit such a heinous crime. Psychopathy suggests that McDonald was in disguise, hidden behind a mask of sanity, and that he was in reality of an opposite nature. Chapter 5 The Impossible Coffee Table You'd better think less about us and what's going to happen to you, and think a bit more about yourself, and stop making all this fuss about your sense of innocence. You don't make such a bad impression, but with all this fuss you're damaging it. Franz Kafka, The Trial when Jeffrey MacDonald was brought in for questioning on April 6, 1970, less than two months after the murders, he was read his rights, declined to have an attorney present, and a tape recorder was turned on. The interview was conducted by CID Chief Investigator Franz Grebner, Agent William Ivory, and Agent Robert Shaw. Grebner first asked for MacDonald's account of the events of February 17th. And I went to bed about... Somewhere's around two o'clock. I really don't know. I was reading on the couch, and my little girl Christy had gone into bed with my wife. And I went in to go to bed, and the bed was wet. She had wet the bed on my side, so I brought her in her own room. And I don't remember if I changed her or not, gave her a bottle, and went out to the couch, because my bed was wet, and I went to sleep on the couch. And the next thing I know, I heard some screaming, at least my wife. But I thought I heard Kimmy, my older daughter, screaming also. And I sat up. The kitchen light was on, and I saw some people at the foot of the bed. So I don't know if I really said anything, or I was getting ready to say something. This happened real fast. You know, when you talk about it, it sounds like it took forever, but it didn't take forever. And so I sat up. And at first, I thought it was, I just could see three people, and I don't know if I, if I heard the girl first, or I think I saw her first. I think two of the men separated, sort of, at the end of my couch, and I keep, all I saw was some people, really. And this guy started walking down between the coffee table and the couch, and he raised something over his head, and just sort of then, sort of all together, I just got a glance of this girl with kind of a light on her face. I don't know if it was a flashlight or a candle, but it looked to me like she was holding something. And I just remembered that my instinctive thought was that she's holding a candle. What the hell is she holding a candle for? But she said before I was hit the first time, kill the pigs, acid's groovy. Now, that's all. That's all I think I heard before I was hit the first time, and... The guy hit me in the head. So I was knocked back on the couch, and then I started struggling to get up, and I could hear it all then. Now I could. Maybe it's really, you know... I don't know if I was repeating to myself what she just said or if I kept hearing it, but I kept... I heard, you know, acid is groovy. Kill the pigs. And I started to struggle up, and I noticed three men now, and... I think the girl was kind of behind them, either on the stairs or at the foot of the couch behind them. And the guy on my left was a, a colored man, and he hit me again. But at the same time, you know, I was kind of struggling. And these two men, I thought, were punching me at the same time. Then I, I remember thinking to myself that, see, I work out with the boxing gloves sometimes. I was then, and I kept, geez, that guy throws a hell of a punch because he punched me in the chest, and, and I got this terrible pain in my chest. And so I was struggling, and I got hit on the shoulder or the side of the head again, 
And so I turned, and I, and I grabbed this guy's whatever it was. I thought it was a baseball bat at the time, and I had, I was holding it. I was kind of working up it to hold on to it. Meanwhile, both these guys were kind of hitting me, and all this time I was hearing screams. That's what I can't figure out, so, let's see, I was holding, so I saw the, and all I got a glimpse was some stripes. Uh, I told you, I think they were E6 stripes. There was one bottom rocker, and it was an army jacket, and the man was a colored man, and the two men, other men, were white. And I didn't really notice too much about them, and so I kind of struggled, and I was kind of off balance, because I was still halfway on the couch and half off, and I was holding on to this thing, and I kept getting this pain, either in, you know, sort of like in my stomach, and he kept hitting me in the chest. And so I let go of the club, and I was grappling with him, and I was holding his hand in my hand, and I saw, you know, a blade. I didn't know what it was. I just saw something that looked like a blade at the time. And so then I concentrated on him. We were kind of struggling in the hallway right there at the end of the couch. And then really the next distinctive thing, I thought that I thought that I noticed that I saw some legs, you know, that not covered, like I saw the top of some boots, and I thought that I saw knees as I was falling. But it wasn't what was in the papers that I saw white boots. I never saw white muddy boots. I saw saw some knees at the top of boots, and I told, I think, the investigators, I thought they were brown, as a matter of fact. And the next thing I remember, though, was lying on the hallway floor, and I was freezing cold, and it was very quiet, and my teeth were chattering, and I went down and to the bedroom. The fact that MacDonald was alive and his family dead started the ball rolling. There was something funny about the living room the scene of McDonald's fight with the hippie intruders. It was too tidy, too neat. When the CID detectives tried to reconcile what they had seen in the house with McDonald's account of what had happened, they became convinced that McDonald was the murderer and that he had staged the crime scene to make it look like there had been intruders. McDonald was presented with a coffee table, a flower pot, and a stack of magazines as though they were smoking guns. Franz Grebner I have been sitting here most of the morning not saying very much and just listening to your story. And I've been an investigator for a long time. And if you were a PFC, private first class, an uneducated person, I might try to bring you in here and bluff you. But you were a very well-educated man, doctor, captain, and I'm going to be fair with you. But your story just doesn't ring true. There's too many discrepancies. For instance, take a look at this picture. Do you see anything odd about that scene? Jeffrey MacDonald. No. It is the first thing I saw when I came to the house that morning. Notice the flower pot? It's standing up. Uh-huh. Notice the magazines? Yeah. Notice the edge of the table right there? I don't understand the significance of it. Okay. The lab technicians, myself, Mr. Ivory, and Mr. Shaw, and any number of other people have tipped that table over. It never lands like that. It is top-heavy, and it goes all the way, even pushes the chair out of the way. The magazines don't land under the leaning edge of the table. They land on the floor. Couldn't this table have been pushed around in the struggle? It could have been, but it would have been upside down when it stopped. The plant and the pot always go straight out, and they stay together in all instances. Well, what are you trying to say? That it is a staged scene. You mean I staged the scene? That's what I think. Do you think that I would stand the pot up if I staged the scene? Somebody stood it up like that. Well, I don't see the reasoning behind that. You just told me I was college-educated and very intelligent. I believe you are. Well, why do you think I would... I don't understand why you think I would stage it that way if I was going to stage it. Grebner keeps returning to this argument. 
that MacDonald had tried to fake evidence of a struggle in his living room, but he had bungled the job. As far as the CID was concerned, the coffee table was fated to land supine, its legs in the air, and if it landed on its edge, MacDonald had to be responsible. The flower pot was standing up, the plant and root ball some distance away. If someone had knocked it over, why was it standing up? The inanimate objects in the room seemed collectively to point an accusatory finger at MacDonald. Grebner and Ivory believed they could reconstruct MacDonald's intentions simply by observing the configuration of the furniture in his living room. They believed they were offering proof of something. The living room scene frozen in time that morning was like an impossible figure in an optical illusion. It could not exist in the real world unless MacDonald himself had created it. Couldn't there be a multitude of other explanations for the position of the coffee table, or any other seemingly sinister detail for that matter? Even if it couldn't have possibly landed that way in a struggle, even if it had to be placed in that position, what did it ultimately show about MacDonald's guilt or innocence? The orderliness of the living room was taken as proof by the CID of MacDonald's guilt, the flower pot, the coffee table, the Valentine's Day cards standing up on the china cabinet in the dining room. But if MacDonald had indeed staged the scene, wouldn't he have done a better job? As MacDonald had said to the CID agents, do you think that I would stand the pot up if I staged the scene? The CID officers were suggesting that there were two McDonald's, a McDonald cunning enough to manufacture a crime scene and a MacDonald too stupid to do it effectively. MacDonald responded near the end of the interrogation. Jesus Christ, this is a nightmare. This is like Edgar Allan Poe. Wow. Apparently you don't know much about my family and myself. I'll tell you that, to come up with this conclusion. Robert Shaw. What kind of a man are you, Captain? You say we don't know much about you. What kind of a man are you? Well, I'm bright, aggressive, I work hard, and I had a terrific family, and I loved my wife very much, and this is the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my whole life. Shaw asked, What kind of man are you? But it was a rhetorical question. McDonald's protests meant nothing. They were expected. The CID detectives had already decided that MacDonald was the kind of man who could brutally murder his family and stage the scene, because they already believed, for whatever reason, that he was guilty. He had to be the kind of man who could do it, because they had already determined that he had done it. On April 7, 1970, the announcement went out from Fort Bragg. Jeffrey MacDonald was the Army's prime suspect in the murder of his wife and two daughters.